Horizon Saga raised in Parliament. Whistleblower's bill passed. And National Electrification Plan being finalised. This is National MTV News with Meriba Tulo. A very good evening. Thank you for joining us. This is National MTV News. Commerce, Trade and Industry Minister William Duma's alleged involvement with Australian oil company Horizon Oil was raised in Parliament after numerous articles were published by Australian media, Australian Financial Review. Deputy Opposition Leader Dr Alan Marat questioned the Prime Minister on whether an investigation would take place and if Minister Duma would be sacked from Cabinet. Prime Minister James Marape responded, emphasising that the Minister is innocent until proven guilty by the country's legal system and would not be sacked based on international media reports. The articles published by Australian Financial Review alleges Duma's involvement in 2011 when he was Petroleum Minister in a deal with the Australian petroleum company Horizon Oil for the securing of a petroleum retention license PRL 21 in the Western Province. The AFR article names lawyers and senior statements reportedly involved in a blackmail attempt to secure 30% discretions of shares in PRL 21 located in Western Province. Mr. Deputy Speaker, when negative issues about Papua New Guinea's national leadership and therefore national governance attracts international publicity in their media, and we only get to know about them when our journalists report them in our news media. In Parliament, Deputy Opposition Leader Dr. Alan Marat stating that the international media reports such as the Horizon Deal continue to taint the corruption perspective in PNG. Dr. Marat questioning if the Prime Minister would discharge duties to communicate with the Ombudsman Commission and PNG Law Society to investigate the alleged official corruption, fraud and bribery in the issuing of PRL 21 by the Department of Petroleum and Energy. With a Tukina shelf company, Elevala Energy Limited, a company purportedly bought by Horizons Oils for US $10.3 million and that shelf company name now, I believe, changed because it has been bought, changed to Rubicon Limited. Dr. Marat finishing his question on whether or not the Prime Minister would sack Minister Duma. But Mr. Deputy Speaker, I say none of this will be the case. So Prime Minister, through you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, will you communicate any suggestion of investigation? urgently to the two authorities because the political, economic and consequentially social ramifications of this corruption is now having a lasting impact on the image of our country and our citizens. And finally, third question, Mr. Prime Minister, will you sack your Minister for Commerce and Industry and replace him with a better one? Prime Minister James Marper responding to the last question first that he would not be sacking Minister Duma because of a media report until sufficient evidence is provided. But if there is corruption involved in this one, by not necessarily minister responsible but the entire system of government that facilitated this transaction, uh, it was corrupted, then upon finding an evidence of corruption, due actions will take course. But at this point in time, everything that has been raised are raised by one media firm in Australia. Marp is stating he had spoken with Minister Duma and he asked him to make a public statement on the issue. And he will make his statement in due course, possibly later today or tomorrow, whenever he feels that he will make this, uh, he has got every uh, sufficient facts organized for him to make this statement. And I don't intend to speak for him. But Prime Minister has stated that key corruption investigation authorities like Ombudsman Commission and police should take it upon themselves to investigate the alleged transactions. But that doesn't mean I will sit on top of this knowledge and not react to it. Legitimate organizations in our country, Ombudsman Commission for that matter, police for that matter, uh, 
do not need Prime Minister's communication to respond to the call to scrutinize such allegations. It is within their constitutional duty to handle these things with due care because as leaders, our conduct stand exposed for public scrutiny and that is part of the job we are paid to be scrutinized. The Prime Minister also stating he has asked his counterpart, Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison, for evidence to also be provided to PNG authorities to allow them to investigate. And as in response to the question, I have sent a request at the highest level to my colleague in Australia. I am interested in this matter. My police will be interested in this matter. My ombudsman will be interested in this matter. I communicated with my colleague, if you can assist with total information as to what has happened. And if anyone amongst us in our country has received money, has infringed, or has conducted steady deal, has infringed, or inferred, I beg your pardon, not infringed, then it is to the interest of fighting corruption in Papua New Guinea that those informations be made available to our own local corruption fighting institutions. And we will then prosecute and help assist in securing justice if corruption was actually perpetuated or committed. Minister William Duma, who is in the front and centre of the Horizon Deal reporting by Australian Financial Review, is expected to make a statement in Parliament before addressing PNG Media. Adelaide Sirox Kari, National, MTV News. The latest scandal involving Minister Duma and Horizon Oil emphasizes the need for the government to legislate company ownerships. This is according to anti-corruption group Act Now. Act Now campaign manager Eddie Tanago says if company ownership is not clear, it allows corruption and tax evasion. Tanago says the government needs to urgently introduce a public register of beneficial ownerships as a simple measure to tackle fraud. Act now released this statement in relation to the Horizon Oil scandal, where a lawyer is alleged to have acquired a company in his own name and was awarded a valuable 10% stake in an exploration license. Act now is calling for a change to the law to place a duty on companies to declare any beneficial ownership as part of their annual reporting obligations. Parliament passed the 2020 Whistleblowers Bill today with a unanimous 90 votes to nil. The bill, now a law, aims to protect public servants who report corruption and malpractices in state departments. Deputy Prime Minister and Attorney General David Stephen said the bill is just one step forward the Marapilet government is taking to encourage accountability within the public sector. The Wishield Blowers Bill, as described by the Attorney General, forms part of the Marapilet government's approach to address the perception of corruption in Papua New Guinea. It complements the anti-corruption initiative and action plan formulated by the government. It is also in line with the government's medium-term development goals to improve security within PNG. When reading out the bill, the Attorney General highlighted the four types of disclosure protection the bill accommodates for. Notable comments raised in support of the 2020 whistleblowers bill include strong statements from entity governor Power Sparkop on how effective other law enforcing agencies like the Ombudsman Commission, the National Fraud and Anti-Corruption Directorate and the Public Prosecutor Function. Western Highlands Governor Pius Winty, East Sipi Governor Alan Bird, and Enga Governor Sir Peter Ipatas, while supporting the bill, said the implementation of the bill must be effective if the government wants to see results. Representing the other side of the House, Deputy Opposition Leader Dr. Alan Marat gave their support towards the passing of the bill, saying it is a step in the right direction. A pleased Prime Minister James Marape, hours after the passing of the bill, posted on his Facebook account saying, Personally, I look forward to ICAC functioning and relate positively with police and ombudsmen going into the future. Thakla Gunga, National MTV News. 
The World Bank is still in the process of finalizing a national electrification plan signed between the PNG government, the United States and Australia during the 2018 APEC summit. State-owned Enterprise Minister Sasindran Mutuvel revealed this in Parliament today. This followed a series of questions from several MPs regarding electrification projects within their electorates. Former MP Elias Kapavore was the first to raise concerns as to why the government has been quiet over the implementation of rural electrification projects in the country. Kapavore says after 15 months since signing the deal, there has been little to no progress made. The Pomeo MP demanded answers and clarification. Because this agreement was signed on the 18th of November 2018. Second question is, can the minister confirm if this funding was released? And what is the status of its implementation? The former Health and Public Service Minister says the electrification rollout project is planned to reach 70% of rural communities by 2030. According to Kapavore, not one update of the power deal is being shared with concerned electorates. Minister responsible Sasindran Mutuva responded, admitting the World Bank is still finalizing a national electrification plan. That plan is set to be released in April. But to date, uh, Mr. Speaker, there is no clarity as to uh, the development partners coming clearly as to which program they are actually funding. That is also part of uh, the reason being the World Bank is uh, concluding the monster plan, that national electrification uh, rollout plan, and also the least cost power strategy. Several supplementary questions were also leveled at the SOE minister. Kendrian Gloucester, Kerema and Wapenamanda MPs all spoke of electrification projects being halted in the electorates. Is the minister aware that Australia and New Zealand are responsible for the rural electrification rollout uh, in the uh, Anga province. The SOE minister says following the agreement signed in 2018 by the previous government, only the Australian government has promised 25 million Australian dollars under its terms. Minister Mutuvel says while waiting, the Marape Stephen government is committed to source power generation through the PNG LNG gas or the use of public-private partnerships in establishing hydropower stations. Whichever provinces and districts have the capacity, but you can't ask me for 100% free. But if there is a generation facility in your district, and if your district or province has the capacity to offer PNG power, we are very, very keen to privatize the generation assets of PNG power so that uh, PNG power can concentrate on distribution uh, and transmission network, uh, Mr. Speaker. The National Electrification Plan signed in 2018 was to the tune of 1.7 billion US dollars. Jack LaPava Jr., National MTV News. The son of the former Menyamia MP has nominated to contest in the Menyamia by-election after the seat was left vacant following his father's passing last year. John Thomas Pelika is running as a member of Sam Basil's United Labour Party and says he hopes to complete his father's work within the next two years. 3 p.m. yesterday, John Thomas Pelika arrived with the party leader Sam Basil at the Electoral Commission office in Leigh. He was one of four candidates who nominated yesterday. After paying his nomination fee, Pelika met with supporters of his father who now expect him to be elected. Uh, when I'm thinking in a plan where Papa been putting him inside a five year development plan, plan was straight into place, money and bring him come inside. And this told me son up me like Pini Simsla Pelika is running as a United Labour Party candidate, a party created by the Bololo MP Sem Basil after the formation of the new government. Basil says he is hopeful that Pelika will win the seat under the ULP ticket. And of of course, in Menyama, there's a construction of a um, uh, power plant, which is about uh, uh, 300, uh, 500 kVA plant, half a megawatt, still under construction. It has to be completed. So there are many projects hanging in the air that needs to be completed. Uh, late Thomas Pelika was mandated by the people of Menyama for five years. Unfortunately, uh, he, he passed on. Also yesterday, Jiwaka Governor Dr. William Tongam announced the nomination of his People's Party candidate, Nolan Nasson, who said roads, education and health are his main priorities. The Electoral Commission in Morabe needs at least 6.5 million kina for this by-election. The provincial government has allocated 500,000 kina for this exercise, but none of that money has yet been paid. Scott Waide, National MTV News, Lay. This is National MTV News. We'll be back with more right after these messages.
Welcome back to National MTV News. With a vision to reduce the threat and impact of cancer in the country, the Papua New Guinea Cancer Foundation is carrying out educational awareness programs. This morning, the foundation visited Hagara Primary School in Port Mosby to educate students on the preventive measures to protect themselves from cancer. The Papua New Guinea Cancer Foundation so far has visited 10 primary schools in NCD since the program started in 2016. This was the second time they visited Hagara Primary School. Senior grade 8 teacher Peter Kismang says students have to be taught at this age on important issues like this. He says certain lifestyle diseases, viruses and illnesses that kill humans are not taught in class. And he was happy that the Cancer Foundation, through the support of ExxonMobil PNG, to educate the students. Mr. Kismang says at this age, children are exposed to anything and teaching them to take precaution is better. And that information might be helpful to them to look after themselves, take care of, them, take care of themselves so that they will look after their own health. And when they're in the good health, they will be able to learn well. And maybe one day they, become, they might become someone important like Prime Minister or uh, someone important in the community and in the country. Each of the grade 8 students who spoke to MTV said they were happy to learn something new and plan to pass it to their families at home. Nowadays, many of Papua New Guineans don't know how to prevent themselves from getting cancer and all about that. So it's been helpful to us from knowing what to do and what to eat how to prevent ourselves from getting cancer and all of that. I learned something very important that uh, we must not smoke and drink and also chew bitona. So the best thing to do is to stop uh, doing those uh, activities. Smoking, drinking and like chewing bitona are bad habits that we students like we are. Like, Young children, we should not practice this. I learned a lot of uh, what were a lot of things in the Cancer Foundation. This is my first time to know what is cancer. Smoking, chewing, and alcohol is not good to us. Thank you. The foundation's marketing coordinator, Deborah Stevens, says the program aims to help young kids make healthier lifestyle choices. We target grades 6 to 8 in primary schools and basically the program is there to um, encourage young kids to make healthy lifestyle choices. Our key messages include don't smoke, don't chew and don't drink alcohol. Since the program started, it has reached more young children to understand and know the dangers of what to consume and what not to consume. Ms. Stevens says the foundation also plans to move to other provinces in the not-so-distant future. Michelle Steven, National and TV News. Operation Open Heart has commenced again this month at the Port Mosby General Hospital. The operation, conducted by volunteer doctors from Australia with support from local doctors, have seen many cardiac patients treated successfully. Today, Rachel Marape, wife of the Prime Minister, visited the patients and presented them with gifts to help put a smile on their faces. The cardiac patients who will be treated under the Operation Open Heart comes from all over the country. They are admitted at Port Mosby General Hospital's ICU ward, awaiting operation. The Operation Open Heart is conducted by volunteer doctors from Australia with assistance from doctors in the country. A parent who was there with his daughter said he was happy with the work they have done to save his daughter's life. Most cardiac patients are waiting operation and have undergone operation are children over five years of age. The oldest patient is 18-year-old Faustina Jerome from Milan Bay Province. She has a heart problem and was having problem with air breathing. But after the operation, she is feeling a lot better. In acknowledging the doctors, Rachel Marape was taken on a tour of the world to visit the patients today. She presented them with gifts, said stories and prayed with the patients awaiting operations. She was also taken into the operating theatre to see how the operation open heart is conducted. She was thankful of the work the doctors are doing to save lives. There are still more patients awaiting surgery and the doctors will be in the country for a while to conduct the operations. Rayon Lakingu National, MTV News. 
The Catholic Bishops' Conference of Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands announced today the launching of the Catholic Safe House Association scheduled for the 30th of June this year. The CBC believes the association will continue to enhance professionalism and standards in working closely with relevant stakeholders. For Catholic-run safe houses, providing safe havens for families in crisis is more than just a community service. They are calling on international NGOs, Catholic leaders and the government to work together to sustain these services. Catholic Safe Houses as an association is to actually support and draw from each other's strength and also to, uh, to encourage each other to working together to improving the lives of our, of our people. But we need to, to see this uh, uh, initiative happening right to the, to the people on the ground. Our experience is that many times the government expect the churches to respond to this. Of course, they are our people, we respond to them. But there is also government commitment that needs to be seen uh, that is very proactive and complementing what we are doing. Political leaders in Anga province believe that through partnership with donor agencies, more services will reach their rural population. These were the sentiments at the groundbreaking ceremony for the new Wabeg market yesterday. Wabeg District Development Authority has partnered with the Australian government to deliver this service for rural farmers to sell their produce. With an interest in delivering services to their people, political leaders from Enga province are now partnering with donor agencies and development partners to source funding for impact projects. One such partner is the Australian government. This model of partnership at the provincial and district level has been acknowledged by Australian High Commissioner to PNG, Bruce Davies. When an Angan politician came to my office, it was probably going to be something of substance and something that had already been very well thought out. In this case, member for Wabag came to my office with this proposal for the market. It wasn't just an idea. It wasn't just a bit of paper. It was already all there, all thought through in all sorts of detail. One project that will be funded under the Special Strategic Project by PNG Australian Partnership Program is the new Wabeg Vegetable Market. The first phase will be funded by DFAT at a cost of 10 million kina. The second phase will be funded by the Wabeg District Development Authority and the third phase by other local and international partners. Wabeg MP and Fisheries Minister Dr. Lino Tom says the DSIP funding will be used to connect missing links for mothers to bring the fresh producers to sell in Wabeg. In a way, shown that partnership can actually grow if you do it with a province that wants to grow. On behalf of the people of Wabeg, on behalf of the Henga Provincial Government, we thank you very much for the four and a half years relationship we had. The event was also the last for the Australian High Commissioner in Enga Province. Enga Governor Sir Peter Ipatas, Kandep MP Alfred Manasse, and Dr. Linotom farewelled High Commissioner Davis and thanked him for partnering with Enga leaders to deliver services in health health and education, as well as infrastructure projects. It's a foundation for the future of Enga. So I want you to go back uh, when you retire, knowing that you have invested well in, in this province and that this investment will have a big, big positive impact on the people of Enga province. Other projects that the partnership has delivered during the High Commissioner's four and a half year stay in PNG are the new four level classrooms at Enga Teachers College, dormitories at Enga College of Nursing, sponsoring of nursing students at the Nursing College, building of the new amphitheater, and more. Vasanata Yama, National MTV News, Mount Hagen. This is Tuesday's news. We'll have more when we return.
Welcome back to National MTV News. Marba teachers came forward today and demanded an explanation from the Provincial Education Division regarding their appointments. Some of the teachers have been teaching for more than six years in Marbe but are now displaced. Julie Badwi Oa reports. The teachers said they've been following up at Morbe's provincial appointment office since beginning this year, but the office was always closed. And every time when I'm displaced, time I come to the office, I'm close, close all the time. Because me got all family, all beginning start to look out the ball. This is city, so we need this office to be open. Joanna Kolikun is one of the displaced teachers who has been teaching for over five years. She last served at Gerup Primary School in the Tewaisiasi district of Morbe province. This year she wasn't given a position. Kolikun said this has always been the case for teachers who serve in Morbe. And right now I'm displaced and I need help from this office. Why is it closed forever in the morning till afternoon by my staff go on and go have no nothing to the house? without any help. <coughs> so please, we need this office to be open when we come to Sevilla. Another displaced teacher is Apisa Kanabu, who has been teaching for 26 years. Kanabu was serving as the senior subject teacher for Omili Primary School in Ley last year. This year, his position was taken off from him. This material to act, but I'm displaced. Why? I've got a teaching certificate, I've got a diploma, I've got a degree in teaching. Why am I displaced in my tenure? And it's my rightful position I should be occupying. And I'm a senior person, 26 years of teaching in Morabe province. And Morabe knows me and I'm not going to be displaced for what reason. I am a teacher as well as I am a parent too. I've got kids to serve at university and college and high school and primary school too. As well as my other comrades there in the big sun. And this big hours of saving us. And why is the office up there is closed to my teachers, fellow teachers as well as uh, the appointment office? It's closed. They have to come and tell us. PNG TA2, I'm talking in front of you. Listen to us and address our problem. And students out there also suffering too. They need teachers to go out and work. And we are educated people, professional people. And we need to be addressed in an uh, orderly manner, just like as you would be addressed. We need these guys to come and tell us their sense of compassion for us. They haven't shown us their demonstrated capabilities yet. They will have to prove our critics strong today, not tomorrow. If they are public servants, they're going to be public servants, not public bosses. MTV News met with the acting provincial program advisor for education, Keith Tangui, and the provincial appointment officer, Paul Tayang, for an explanation to the teachers' grievances today. Tangui said the school inspectors and the district education manager were given directions to give updates of teachers who are already given positions and are currently teaching in the classrooms. The displaced teachers would be sorted out by next week once they get an update from the inspectors and the DEM on the availability of positions. Using that data we'll be able to find oh, which teachers are already available at the school following the posting that's already been done and reviewed. Uh, which ones have left to transfer elsewhere to other provinces and uh, uh, which ones are still vacant. So using that information uh, we will be able to put those who are outside like the new graduates, the uh, transfer in, so really stages from another province coming in to those vacant positions. The provincial appointment officer Paul Tayang confirmed that the teachers would be given the positions before next month. Tayang said he will also make sure the teachers won't be put off payroll. At the same time, we have new graduates, they are still waiting. We need to go proper look into the documents to make sure their documents are in order. <coughs> we found out that there are some Teachers, new graduates, their documents are not in order. They are fraudulent documents, so they have a process that we need to go through, screen them before we make appointment to new graduates. Also, we give priority to our uh, saving teachers who are displaced before we look at the teachers coming in from other provinces, releasing teachers. Because um, they are our saving teachers and they need to be given positions. At, at this moment, I'm going through signing all the summer receipts 
to make sure that uh, these are not off the payroll during the auto suspension time. So once I clear that off and I get updates from the inspectors and the district revenue managers, then these displaced stitches, I will sort them out with the new graduates and the, the released entities. Julie Badui, OA, National MTV News, Lay. Still in Lay, residents are worried that the uplift of the ban on the one bell alcohol will do more harm than good. Some others say the alcohol should be taken off the shelves for good, as they have witnessed unusual behavior from those who have consumed it. Lay residents, especially mothers, say the uplift of the ban on the one bell alcohol is a health concern for the public, especially vulnerable consumers such as teenage boys. These women of Butibam village say they had initially carried out awareness in the community against consumption of the alcohol product when it first came out after noticing unusual behavior from consumers. Me blast up, I'm blaluki plant, tipiki, blum blow drilling, all can bar up him house, all sleep as nothing, pick pick him all let number, bar up him more than something to the community. All picking in the place, all said drink. Stop blowing all in the street. Time will drink pennies, also make it kind, kind. You look him, you buy for it. The One Bell Alcohol Factory in Lay was told by city health authorities to stop operations last month for an indefinite period for not complying with government regulations. This followed complaints from Lay residents regarding the effects and damages caused by the alcohol. The LULLG Health Authority requested for a second lab test from the National Analytical Lab at Unitech which shows an increased percentage of alcohol compared to what was labeled on the product. The results, however, does not show the volume of the product sample. You drink ready mix. You drink You can feel the effect. The temporary closure notice was uplifted by LULLG city manager Joel Colum based on a second lab test result from the NAL and a medical report from Anga Hospital Emergency and Accident Unit. When the situation in the community in the settlement, I'm going so, when something will make it more bad, I'm going to make it more bad. I'm going to make it more bad. Meanwhile, Mr. Colum said individuals should consume the alcohol product responsibly. Shalin Eri, National MTV News, Lay. To some news abroad now, in just over 24 hours, a trans-Tasman coronavirus mission will be underway in Japan. It will end a fortnight of misery for Kiwis and Aussies on board the quarantine cruise ship watching infections mount. But there's a big catch and passengers from both sides of the ditch are unhappy about it. As part of a multinational evacuation from this coronavirus hot zone, 11 New Zealanders, trapped for two weeks, offered a seat on Australia's Mercy flight out of Japan. The big condition, another fortnight's enforced quarantine when they land. We're finding the thought of um, being put on a plane with you know, people who, who hasn't been tested yet and, and potentially getting the infection right then after we've already completed um, almost two weeks of quarantine, uh, not ideal. Some of the New Zealanders who will spend it in Whangaparawa frustrated too. I absolutely understand the frustration that will exist there. They have been in quarantine, but unfortunately um, we have seen cases continue. Overnight, another 99 coronavirus cases were reported on board the Diamond Princess, bringing the total confirmed infections to 454, meaning more than 1 in 10 people have become sick since the ship was quarantined. Two of those are Kiwis, still recovering in a Japanese hospital, they won't be on the rescue flight. And those who don't take up the offer of a seat will be barred from entering New Zealand for two weeks. We want to make sure that we're putting the health and safety of New Zealanders, of our public, as our number one concern. For those people, there is a very clear path back to New Zealand. Let's take a look at just how widely this outbreak has spread. Globally, the number of cases has topped 73,000, with the majority 
here in red, at least 72,000 of them in the Hebei province. It's a similar story when you look at the number of fatalities too. At least 1,800 people have been killed by the virus and that tiny slither right there, well that's the five cases outside mainland China. The country's ambassador to New Zealand saying China's doing all it can and slamming our government's travel ban. WHO as the most professional and authoritative international organization overlooking the global health has clearly recommended that it, 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 there is no need for any limit on travel and trade. As for the 157 people who've spent the last two weeks quarantined north of Auckland, they're leaving tomorrow before the next group arrives. This is National MTV News. We go for another break. When we come back, some sporting updates in Trukai Sports. Trukai Sports. Welcome to Trukai Sports. The SP Sports Awards are into its 28th year and this year a new category has been introduced as well with a new category named after former SP Brewery Managing Director Stan Joyce. The nominations for the awards are open with the close of nominations in April and the awards to be handed out in May. The 28th SP Sports Awards was launched today with a new category named after a longtime supporter of sports in the country, the former managing director of SP Brewery, Stan Joyce. The award will be for organizations that provide outstanding and continued support to sport. It will be presented every two years. We introduced a new category called the Stan Joyce Award in recognition of the contributions done to our past MD towards sports, towards the sports awards. The Stan Joyce Award will go to the corporate companies um, and the criteria of the award is, there's four criteria. One is uh, the longevity, two is the creativity behind uh, their support in the community, three is the actual impact of, the, of their support uh, in the community, and four is actually achievements if they've won some accolades along the way. The categories still remain the same with the prestigious male and female athlete of the year, the pinnacle of the awards night. 28 years has been a long time with some notable winners of the prestigious male and female category over the past years. Notable nominees uh, from the past include the headhunter Stanley Nandex, rugby league superstar Marcus Bay, Superfish, Ryan Penny, uh, Golden Girl Dika Toa, powerlifter uh, Linda Paulson, of course, track queen, toy whistle. It will be quite hard to choose from this year with outstanding achievements on the sporting front in 2019. The Pacific Games being the main sporting highlight, but also the Baramandi's T20 qualification and the Rugby League triumphs by the men's and women's national teams are just a few of the triumphs by Papua New Guinea sporting men and women. On this occasion, it's uh, always... Uh inspiring to, to recognize our elite uh, sportsmen and women as well as uh, officials and also achievements on the national scene, not excluding uh, people with disability. The launching was marked by a nomination by the three Johns, Sir John Dawan Inkura, President of PNGOC, John Nilkare, Corporate Affairs Manager of SP Brewery, and John Susuve, the Marketing and Events Manager for the PNG Sports Foundation. It's a milestone event that we look forward to every year, and uh, uh, this year won't be any different. And uh, our aim is to lift the bar every year with uh, whatever support uh, we do or on the actual night. So uh, I'd like to thank uh, the organizing committee for their hard work. Nominations close on the 3rd of April, with the awards night to be on the 30th of May. Fidelis Sukina National MTV Sports. The Rugby League in Tonga has been expelled from the International Rugby League. This comes after the Pacific Island team was suspended in October 2019 over several issues including a player boycott called by players including Jason Tamalolo and Andrew Fifita. Last year's suspension came after the sacking of national head coach Christian Wolf, relating to disagreements over money and governance of the team. 
This resulted in an unresolved fallout between the Tongan board, its staff and players to date. At its board meeting last Thursday, IRL directors carefully considered the position of Tonga National Rugby League which has been suspended since October 2019 in light of a wide-ranging consultation with stakeholders. After that meeting, the board wrote to Tonga National Rugby League advising them of the resolution passed at that meeting which is to expel Tonga National Rugby League from its membership. Tonga NRL has been given a week to appeal the board's decision. The matter will be decided by the members in a general meeting should Tonga choose to appeal the decision by International Rugby League. Don't go anywhere, we'll have more of Trukai Sports right after these messages. Trukai Sports Welcome back to Trukai Sports. Oceania Fight Promotions will be hosting the Silver Lightweight Championship fight between PNG's Junior Akauko Raka and Rolden Aldea from the Philippines. The fight is scheduled for the 25th of April at the St. John Guys Indoor Complex in Port Moresby. Kauko Raka Jr. will be contending in the World Boxing Council Asia sanctioned Silver Lightweight Championship. The match is set for 10 rounds by 3 minutes in the lightweight division. The parties uh, from the Elode gym in, in Manila have agreed to the terms of the, of the, of the contract for the fight. And uh, the mixed uh, martial arts gym here headed by Mr. Jamie Peng has agreed to the terms of the uh, contract uh, of the fight. This is the first bout for the year organized by Oceania Fight Promotions. So OFP is now affiliated with World Boxing Council, ABCO. So we can host interim championship title and then contend, uh, contending belt title and then go on to world title. Kaukuraka participated in all four international bouts last year, winning all his fights and is aiming for another win on the 25th of April. Number one, um, Junior Ruck has got what it takes. I think he can go all the way to the top. Uh, let's see PNG get back, get behind him. It's a very important fight for PNG and for himself. Um, he'll represent our gym accordingly. And uh, if there's anyone who'd like to sponsor or get behind us, these things aren't cheap. So let's make it happen for PNG. Raka is determined to win this fight, which will place him in the rankings to fight other international boxers. I'm dreaming of me, so I'm still climbing up at Dreamer, Dreamer, and Lumi, so I'm like, thank you, Lord. I'm going to go back to the Lumi. Big plug of the team, Lumi, Lord. Jim. Elijah Lavette, National MTV Sports. Timing is everything. Just ask the UFC. They are staging a full promotion in Auckland this weekend, coming off the back of a historic recognition for mixed martial arts at the Helberg Awards last week. Now, other Kiwi fighters are looking to emulate Israel Adesanya. They're used to fighting in the octagon, but a bigger fight is well and truly on for New Zealand's top MMA athletes. The sport's in its strongest period in New Zealand after Israel Adesanya's groundbreaking Sportsman of the Year win at the Helberg Awards. I had so many people asking me about it, you know, people that I never thought were interested in the sport or, or you know, um, gave it any respect uh, I now had their eyes open to it. And Dan Hooker's now leading the group that has the task of opening more eyes this weekend at UFC Fight Night in Auckland, the third on our shores. With middleweight champion Adesanya absent from the card, the occasion is huge for Hooker in the main event against Paul Felder. This weekend couldn't be any more important this, this weekend. I'm, I'm, I'm all in, you know, I've mortgaged the house, I've, I've committed to this so much. I've got everything, this means everything to me. Felder's all too aware of the wave the sport's riding in New Zealand. The American amongst those welcomed on to Oraki Marai today, having had a welcome of a different kind in the days since he arrived. We've been walking around the, 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 the park that we're staying in an Airbnb near and guys yelling out their cars to me and stopping their cars. They yell, Felder, you know, I'm a big fan. Felder hoping to pull in more fans for himself and the sport against the local lad on another momentous night for MMA in New Zealand. That ends Shukai Sports for this evening. When we come back, we take a look at the weather forecast for the next 24 hours. Shukai Sports. Shukai Sports.
This weather update is proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. A look at the weather forecast for the next 24 hours in the southern region. Fine in Port Mosby, mostly fine in Alata. Fine becoming cloudy later on for Daru and Kerma. And rain and showers expected in Popondeta. To the Momasi region, some showers and drizzles in Leh. Some showers expected in Wau. Rain and showers in Madang. Rain and thunderstorms over the next 24 hours expected in Wiwak and Vanimo. To the New Guinea Islands region, cloudy weather and some showers expected in Lorangao, Kokopo and Rabao. Rain showers expected in Caving and Kimbe. Cloudy weather and showers as well expected in Buka. And in the Highlands region, Mindy and Wabe can expect fine weather over the next 24 hours. Rain and showers expected in Mount Hagen, Goroka and Kundiawa. And all these major centers can expect early morning fog to develop. The weather update was proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. And that's the way it is today, Tuesday the 18th of February 2020. On behalf of the National TV News team, present viewing, good night.